29. So I declare the meeting open to the public. Um, can I remind members the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast through Parliament buildings and online. We have four members uh, attending the meeting in person and we have three members attending via video conference. So we've got myself, Emma Sheeran, the chair, uh, Mike Nesbitt, the vice chair, Michelle McElveen and Christopher Stalford in person and we have John O'Dowd who is attending his capacity as Caroline Cullen's deputy. We've got Paula Bradshaw and we've got Mark H. Durkin all online. So the first item on our agenda is apologies. We don't have any apologies because we're all present and correct. The second item on our agenda today is uh, a briefing on the Bill of Rights from the Equality Coalition. And we have got Daniel Holder and Patricia McKeown attending via Starleaf. I don't see Patricia on yet. Technological problems, but maybe Daniel can make a start. Okay, so we've got some technological issues that mean Patricia isn't just with us yet. So um, we can begin with Daniel. So Daniel um, is a member of the Equality Commission who are jointly convened by UNISON and uh, CAJ, which I think Daniel represents. Uh, there are over 90 members across the North which work across all nine equality categories covered by Section 75. So we've got a clerk's memo at page five of your meeting papers, and then we also have a table papers pack uh, that arrived with us today, which um, contains a briefing from Daniel and Patricia. So, Daniel, welcome to the meeting. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much. If you want to begin your briefing. Oh, OK, obviously, hopefully, Patricia will be able to, to join us soon. So I'm Daniel Holder, the deputy director of, of, of CAJ, and we co-convene the Equality Coalition along with um, Unison. I should just declare that prior to starting CAJ in 2012, I did work in the Human Rights Commission, um, and that would include the time it produced the Bill of Rights advice, although my role in it was uh, limited at that time. So I mean, the Equality Coalition, you've already introduced us. We're over uh, 90 NGOs and trade unions. We work across the different equality grounds. We provide a forum for unity between different sectors, and we have a long track record of uh, campaigning for the implementation of the uh, of the rights-based provisions in the peace agreement, including the, the Bill of Rights. Actually, last year in uh, April 2019, we issued what we called the Manifesto for a Rights-Based Return to Power Sharing in the context of the absence of the Stormont institutions. And this recalled that the Bill of Rights and uh, other key rights-based commitments in the peace agreements were, were safeguards to counter and prevent abuses of power, discriminate to decision-making and, and rights deficits. And we highlighted in that we felt the executive had clapped, collapsed in the context of such safeguards not having been implemented. And there was a risk that the institutions would, would collapse again for similar reasons if that remained the case. So for us very much, the, the Bill of Rights has been a, a safeguard that would underpin the power sharing institutions on a much more sustainable thing. And we feel that the Bill of Rights could have prevented, not, not RHA, but many of the other issues that destabilised power sharing and, and contributed to its collapse. And that would include legislation and policy, which, it would, which just would not have been lawful had the Bill of Rights um, been in place. It, it also includes issues around the, the diversion of executive business into sort of repeated attempts to enact rights-based provisions, many of which had come from previous agreements. Um, that, that had then been blocked that would have actually already been in place had the Bill of Rights been there and that time would have been saved. We also recalled how the sort of petition of concern was tied very much into the Bill of Rights. Um, I think one of the concerns we've had of, uh, as a long time, and I know it's been raised by some of your other contributors as well, um, is that there still are, in some of the debates on a Bill of Rights, basic misunderstandings as to the implications of its provisions, particularly around economic, social and cultural rights. Sometimes we feel there's still a, a bit of an influence of a, a sort of exceptionalist approach that's, that's more common in, say, English political circles that insists that economic and social rights can't be enshrined in, in Bills of Rights in the way other uh, uh, civil and economic rights can. I mean, we don't agree with that. And I know you've already evidence um, uh, from others that deals with this issue. But I mean, economic, social and cultural rights are operating in many other jurisdictions without any other problems that are that are put forward. The rights in question have long been committed to by the UK as a matter of international law and have been quite well codified in the same way as, as civil and political rights have often. I think from our perspective as well, a second area of misconception tends to focus on the misconstruing the nature of economic and social rights themselves. And 
example I wanted to briefly focus on is the right to housing. So, I mean, contrary to popular myth, this does not require the state to build housing for the entire population or otherwise provide everyone with a house. That's neither practical or necessary. But, but what it does do, which we think is, is helpful in our specific circumstances, is firstly, it places positive obligations on states to take reasonable steps to prevent homelessness, provide equal and non-discriminatory access to, to housing to focus on those most in need for example but it also places negative obligations on public authorities to prevent undue interference in the rights of right of housing so what, what do we mean we mean things like look you can't not build houses in a particular area just because the most of the people who are likely to live in them are going to be from the other side of the community you can't fail to provide housing to meet identified objective housing need of a particular group whether that's addressing sort of identified inequalities like the are for Catholics and nationalists or failing to provide provision for groups with specific needs, whether that's travelers, former service personnel, refugees, etc. And funnily enough, it wouldn't be compatible with the right to housing not to provide housing as it might affect the results of an election, the, the issues around gerrymandering. It wouldn't be compatible to subject housing provision to mission from representatives of another com community or to provide public housing where it's least rather than it's, than it's most needed. You couldn't, for example, just retain peace lines to stop people moving to live on the, the other side of them. So I suppose the point I'm trying to make is the right to housing and the way it should be framed is not something that would upset a, a minister's or, or housing policy in general. It's really a, a safeguard against rather extreme actions in the housing sphere, which do sadly relate closely to, to the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. So what we've done in our written evidence, and I must apologise for the tardiness of it, we only, because of other priorities and everything being so busy at the moment, we only completed it and, and were able to provide this morning. Um, but it does focus on the example of how the Bill of Rights, if it would have been in place, would have precluded a number of the problems that have impacted on the sustainability of the, the institutions in recent years. That includes, obviously, issues like Brexit that hadn't happened when the Human Rights Commission last issued at its face, and we've always noted that a hard Brexit as such couldn't have actually happened in, 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 in the North if it, if it was for a Bill of Rights um, being in place. And I suppose a sec second significant change in the 20 years since the Belfast or Good Friday Agreement has, has been the demographic change, where we're no longer in a simple majority-minority uh, dynamic. Um, that, that, no long, that type of framing no longer holds, and we've always pointed to how the equality of treatment, parity of esteem provisions or, will protect both main communities as well as the rights of others. So I, I leave it at that. There will be other things Patricia had, had wanted to add there, but, but overall, we do see the Bill of Rights as an essential safeguard to the functioning of, uh, of power and, and the institutions as well as a baseline resolving a lot of issues that have clearly become quite intractable, but were meant to be uh, as the, the institutions were supposed to operate in that way from the outset. Thank you, Daniel. I think Patricia has now joined us. We've got a blank screen. Um, can you, can you hear, hear or see me? We can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. I do not know why, but <laughs> I do apologise. I've been in the waiting room for a very long time. Um, so apologies, Chair and Committee, but also apologies to Daniel for um, having to start without me there. Um, he has covered the core um, of our, our position. I suppose if I, if I wanted to, to highlight a couple of points, um, we were very clear 20-odd years ago when we were campaigning for these kind of provisions, both in the peace agreement and the subsequent Northern Ireland Act, that the power to legislate for a Bill of Rights should be vested in uh, Westminster with the UK government um, for the reason that we didn't anticipate it would be easy to get political consensus here. And that is still very much our position. Ironically, the, the fact that we haven't got political consensus was given back to us by the UK government consistently as a reason for not having acted on the Bill of Rights over the years. The other point I would make is that the last time we had um, a detailed engagement with our own political system um, was at the um, point of the year-long Bill of Rights Forum. 
um, which had many positive aspects to it. It didn't result in the, the kind of agreement we could have hoped for, um, but it was important that that, um, that, that exercise um, explored issues such as um, the progressive realisation of rights, uh, because I think there was a fear among some, particularly on, on the political party side, that what we were seeking in a, a Bill of Rights would in some way um, diminish their own ability to be decision makers, and that was never the case. Is that you, Patricia? Or have we I, I, I think Daniel has covered um, the essence of, of the rest of it. No, that's that's a hundred percent. Thank you very much. And no need to apologise. Technology can is a, is a battle that does not discriminate. It can affect us all. So I have been there. Thank you very much. Um, and apologies. I'm not sure what what happened there. It may well have been something on our side that that kept you in the waiting room. But thank you both um, for your time this afternoon and, and for the presentation, um, both in in verbal form and for for what you provided. I want to ask um a question or two. You've referred in the, the document about the changes uh, since 2008, not, not least in the context of Brexit. And then you've made uh, references to the recommendation of the incorporation of the provision in the Bill of Rights to ensure the right of the people here to hold British or Irish citizenship. And the fact that um, had this provision been in place, it would have mo most notably precluded the imposition of a hard Brexit in the North. And then you go on to, to talk about the fact that... Um, as things stand, British citizens here face detrimental and differential treatment compared to Irish uh, citizens. I'm wondering if you could expand on this and, and what you see the, the risks um, coming into to this phase, obviously, where we're leaving the EU. Yeah, I'm happy to pick mm. that up. And I mean, there are, there are detriments and differences for both British citizens. Citizens, they're just different. I mean, in our, in our written evidence, we outline the, the, the sort of fairly obvious issue that Irish citizens will retain EU citizenship and some basic EU free movement rights, so they will lose most EU rights that British citizens won't. So there's the first differential. But the, I think it's important to note that the citizenship provisions weren't just about which passport you could have, but were about that very important principle that was going to be written in the, in the Bill of Rights about equality of treatment, regardless of that choice that the UK government itself has emphasised during the Brexit process. But in fact... Legislative basis underpinning the quality of treatment between British and Irish citizens, i.e. the legal obligation to, to treat people the same, has really been underpinned for decades by EU free movement law. That's been the legislative basis, and that's going to be stripped away, which leaves Irish citizens in actually a fairly precarious position, whereby all that's left really are non-binding and at times fairly vague political promises that there will be equality of treatment due to common travel area, but they are non-binding and are only in certain areas. To give you some, some practical examples of that, um, one of the areas we were looking at, and a lot of this is only coming to light now, are things like the civil service nationality rules. There are some civil service posts that are only available to British citizens at the moment, some that are open to British or other EU citizens. Um, uh, and the logic of Brexit is that the government isn't clear as to what its position is on this, that that could be changed to restrict to British citizens and, and actually Commonwealth citizens is another category. Um, and that's something, I mean, it's come up recently with the recruitment directly linked to Brexit, obviously, of Border Force officers, whereby the Home Office is recruited here, but restricted those posts to British citizens only. So you can't be, I suppose, what's the equivalent of a constable in the, in the in Border Force, but you can be the chief constable of the PSNA, and you don't have to be a, a, Br a British citizen to do that, but you do have to be a British citizen to do the former. So that's just one of the areas where this could come up. Another one is things like non-cash benefits from health trusts. I'm, putting, I'm thinking of things like home helps and residential care. At the moment, that's restricted to either British citizens or people exercising EU treaty rights. So where do Irish citizens fall post that, as well as other uh, EU citizens when EU rights are no longer being exercised? If you could give a final example, which is the other way around, around an impact on British citizens, and this links to what the Irish government's role is, um, at the moment, we have a position whereby, as a matter of policy, the UK government has said there won't be any passport controls whatsoever on the land border. It's, it's failed to give that guarantee about the sea border. It says there won't be any regular passport controls. And our concern, obviously, is, well, that means irregular controls, and that tends to mean 
checks that are conducted on the basis of racial discrimination, which is which is quite alarming. Essentially, a border on the Irish Sea, but it's a it's a border on the Irish Sea that affects black people and other ethnic minorities. Um, in terms of the Irish government, their legislation at the moment is inherently discriminatory. It, ex it exempts British, uh, sorry, Irish citizens and other people exercising EU trading rights from having to carry passports to cross the land border. But of course, British citizens and, and uh, Northern Ireland-born British citizens will cease to be exercising EU rights post-Brexit, and therefore, may, as the law stands, would fall to have to carry passports over the land border as, a, as of next year. So if something was enshrined in a Bill of Rights um, that, re that uh, pre precluded passport controls within common travel areas to and from Northern Ireland, um, you'd then look to those equivalence provisions that the Irish government have uh, under the uh, Belfast Agreement as well to try and make reciprocal provision there. Otherwise, we're, I think we're walking into a whole load of things where there's no proper legal underpinning of the right to equal treatment between British and Irish citizens. And the, the impacts of that, I think, will, will begin to come to light um, as the transition period ends. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and, and that's a really broad overview. I suppose in terms of, of Brexit, there's all sorts of conversations happening at the minute about the risks. In terms of the Internal Market Bill, I know that the um, Equality Commission and the Human Rights Commission had issued a joint statement along with the 26 County um, Human Rights Commission last week or the week before about their fears of some of the amendments to the Internal Market Bill that is going through the House of Lords at the minute. Do you guys have, have fears uh, specific to the Internal Market Bill and the risks that it might pose um, to, to the rights of people in the North post-Brexit? I mean, yes, I, I can think would be the, the same as the, the Human Rights and Equality Commissions. Essentially, this is a breach of the uh, Good Friday Agreement in that it diminishes the incorporation of the European Convention of Human Rights into Northern Ireland law, which is a core provision of the of the agreement, um, insofar that, it, that that bill would allow that it would Disapply that in relation to the the, the issues that are covered, um, in relation to state aid, in relation to, to goods, etc. Um, and I mean that was the case before the bill was amended. It's even more expressly the case now um, when that specific position has been has been pushed in. And you have to recall that that is aligned to the UK government having a uh, having agreed in the withdrawal agreement in the protocol. Um, that there would be a guarantee of no diminution in certain good trade agreement rights, which would incorporate the provisions of the HCHR. And there's currently, uh, there's this bill, there's, there's others that are already diminishing um, commitment within the agreements. But this bill is particularly worrying because it sets aside, it would set aside the, the, the only ability to enforce that through the powers that it was giving to the Equality and Human Rights Commission. So. Yes, I, I think it highlights as well, and, and Patricia may have more to say on this, but, this, but other areas um, whereby the only legal underpinning in the absence of a Bill of Rights was through EU law, I'm thinking of areas of working workers' rights um, and equality rights, and, and the risks that they could now be repealed or amended as they, they'll no longer be requirements of EU law post-Brexit. Uh, I, I, I would add that, um, I mean, over the years, those those who if you like, opposed uh, uh, an inclusive and forcible Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, argued that it wasn't necessary because the ECHR and the Human Rights Act 1998 were both in place. Like, quite clearly, as, as Daniel is saying, the, the, um, the current bill um, diminishes the ECHR, but we're also dealing with the fact that the current UK government is on record several times uh, uh, on its stated position that it wishes to dismantle the uh, Human Rights Act 1998. And of course, it was that act that gave effect to the um, commitments in the Good Friday Agreement and the Northern Ireland Act. So it's a very disturbing time. No, I uh, don't disagree with a lot of what you've said there. Thank you very much. Um, I'll pass to the Vice Chair, Mike. Chair, thank you very much, Daniel and Patricia. Hiya. Um, Hello. Hello. Yeah. You, <clears throat> I think you're arguing that a Bill of Rights could have a very significant impact and a significantly positive impact <clears throat> on the way 
the coalition government here at Stormont would, would, would operate. Uh, in fact, in paragraph four of your paper, you say it's notable the Bill of Rights could have prevented many of the issues that destabilized power sharing and contributed to its collapse. Could you expand on that for me, please? They can start on that, Patricia, if, if you yeah. want. There, there are actually is a, a number of examples that are given um, within the written evidence itself. Some of them relate to the issues, obviously, that have been very destabilizing over Brexit that we've just had a good rattle at, so I'll maybe pick some of the, the other examples. Um, second example we've placed in there relates to the issue of, of minority rights, provision from the Irish language and, and things like that. I mean, that created huge controversy and huge destabilization within the institutions. The, the LIFA decision is perhaps one that's, that's most associated with the collapse of the institutions. But there were a number of departments that did things like drop, adopted single language policies, i.e. English only policies that would have been unlawful had the Bill of Rights been in place. Um, and the whole climate around the lack of respect for, for, for the, the rights holders of the Irish language speaking community was one of the major issues that not only destabilised power sharing, but made it very difficult to get power sharing re-established. We include an example of that in the, in the paper. Um, another area would be issues around um, housing that I've already had um, uh, 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 alluded to in the in the opening remarks, but there, there were examples, for example, uh, that that would fall into this category of fairly extreme actions by public authorities. We have a number of examples whereby uh, requests for housing were refused until essentially the, the, the political representatives of the other side agreed, which is a, in essence a sectarian veto over over housing that, that created considerable tensions too. We had one particular Department of Social Development program that had among its criteria for, for regeneration schemes, not indicators of housing need as such, but things like significant levels of empty properties, uh, areas that have experienced the decline in housing need, and even places that were in proximity to places where there was actually housing need be, being a criteria. And these are the type of things, although that was investigated by the Equality Commission and a breach of equality scheme was found, there'd be much better remedies under the under the Bill of Rights. And I think really this is about, um, and, and without casting up um, these issues to, to sort of pass governments and, and things like that, because every political constituency has a fear about what some of the political parties representing other groups may do when in power. I think everyone has that. I noticed uh, Albie Sachs's evidence in particular had that, that starting point of maybe asking, well, what are your fears about how power will be exercised? And then that's the type of thing that could shape what should be in a Bill of Rights. Final example we have in the paper, and I mean, there's many, many other areas what we could elaborate on. The final example we have is just the whole destabilization actually prior to the previous collapse that was created by the UK government's welfare reform agenda. Now, the Bill of Rights itself would not prevent changes being made to social security policy per se, but it would have a very minimum flaw that would protect against regressive steps that were either arbitrary or unfairly deprived individuals of support or put persons in a, in a state of of destitution, and there were certainly elements of the welfare reform provisions, as indeed the mitigations package recognises, that, that would have crossed that threshold. And I think that the hand of the executive in, in negotiating with the UK over the impact of welfare reforms would have been strengthened if basically the implementation of an equivalent of the welfare reform bill in Northern Ireland would have been de facto or de jure unlawful. I think also um, to that, uh, I would add, you know, we have to go back 20 odd years to our, our hopes and aspirations at the at the time of the peace agreement and the commitments within it. Um, and that um, that that very um, interlinked relationship between equality and human rights. And our hope was that our new government would be operating within an equality and rights-based framework and that that would move us forward in this society. Now, had we had a Bill of Rights at an early stage, it would not have been a panacea to solve all of our difficulties, but that coupled with the political will, for example, um, to implement Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act, we believe would have put us in a better space. For example, we might now, by now 20 years on, have tackled some of the, the worst of health inequalities in this society. We might be in better shape 
to deal with this pandemic. Um, we have still hopes that our uh, returning government um, would agree to uh, start to operate within a, a, an equality and human rights based framework. Um, but frankly, um, given the given the um, the tensions on this within the executive uh, over the years, um, the difference a bill of rights would make is that everybody's operating to the sta same standard without having to argue whether it should be a standard in the first place, and that's particularly true, I think, on social and economic rights. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you. I'm just wondering. <clears throat> excuse me. In terms of the, the, the examples like the LIFA grant, whether that's the problem or whether actually it's a consequence of the problem, with the problem actually being a breakdown in relationships in terms of partnership government. And if it's the latter, does the Bill of Rights fix it? We well, said, sorry. sorry, go ahead, Patricia, go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Patricia. It must be the technology, because Patricia... I will, pro I will proceed with it. Um, clearly, the Bill of Rights isn't going to resolve all governance issues, but a lot of the issues that have become intractable. And just to give other examples, I mean, even things like the, the incomplete nature of our equality legislation, which has been fiercely argued over, there's gaps so, and provisions on sexual orientation, age, goods, facilities, services, um, delivering things about conflict-related convictions and things like that. All of those issues would have already been dealt with um, by, by the Bill of Rights. Now, it wouldn't have dealt with any, everything, but a lot of the breakdown of relationships over things like Irish language rights and things like that, they would have been issues that would have already been addressed. I mean, to give a comparator, can you imagine how difficult it would have been um, for the Assembly on the Devolution of, of Justice to have taken forward uh, patent and police reform at that point, rather than having it as a matter that was already settled as a set of claim reforms that were part of a package as part of the peace settlement. Now, that was what the Bill of Rights was supposed to be. It was supposed to be in place, and it was supposed to have resolved a number of those issues, and it would have, to give the equality law example, it would have already required as a matter of law, a lot of those issues to have been dealt with. So the countless hours of energy, including the exhaustion from, from civil society of, of constantly having to go back and, and battle over, say, um, improvements to equality law, but also the political energy that was expent on that, a lot of that wouldn't have happened because it already would have been part of the, the legal framework provided for by a Bill of Rights, but it also would have constrained some of the more controversial elements of, of political power. It also would have shaped, of course, in terms of a governance issue, the petition of concern, and in, in that um, it would have been, as it was intended, a tool to scrutinise as to whether a particular bit of legislation or measure um, would have um, engaged and unduly interfered with the rights of any section of the, the community, rather than what it became, which was essentially more of a a political veto without uh, set criteria that was something else that that damaged the governance relationships. Um, so we're not saying it's going to resolve every uh, issue, but we do think that if the Good Friday Agreement had, had been thought through, it was very much thought that this particular safeguard would be key in ensuring the effective functioning of the governance arrangements and making this jurisdiction work. Yeah, you see, at, at paragraph 16, you talk about the LIFA grant. Um, you say the decision to cut <clears throat> the modesty for grant is known for its direct role in the collapse of the devolved institutions in 2017. Uh, <clears throat> whether that's accurate or not is, is uh, I suppose, debatable, but would a Bill of Rights have meant that the Minister could not have made the decision to cut the grant? Um, in terms of that particular decision, um, it was one of the ones that was that was cited in relation to the then Deputy First Minister's resignation, which is why, he, and it, it, as a sort of straw that broke the camel's back issue, which is why it's cited and in, in that context been known. Um, yes, a Bill of Rights would have constrained um, the ability of uh, a minister to make a decision if that decision was grounded in 
uh, discrimination on the basis of it being an Irish language scheme. Now, of course, you'd have to go into the detail of why the decision is made, and we know there are virtually no records. In fact, they were released under freedom of information, and the, the minister's response was simply no scheme without being given reason. But if you look at that decision in context, officials produce a paper. Officials produce a paper about this modest scheme. They extol the benefits of the scheme. And then a decision is made without explanation to cut it. And if that constituted discrimination on the grounds that it was an Irish language scheme, which certainly um, it appears to be the case, then yes, that would not have been possible. It would have been unlawful under a Bill of Rights because it would have constituted an executive act that was discrimination on the grounds of language, something that isn't presently um, okay. unlawful. Okay, so just to pursue that, Daniel, and I'm, you know, we're using this as an example. I'm not arguing that the decision to cut the grant was right. But I think the minister said he was cutting the grant because he couldn't afford it. And if that is the case, and we also support progressive realisation of rights, does that not take away from political power? Because what you're suggesting is that inevitably you would end up in the courts uh, with a judicial review of that decision. If, um, if the decision was generally taken, genuinely taken because it was unaffordable and it was in the context of efficiency savings as had been claimed in the, in the time, then it could have been a lawful decision. I mean, I know we're trying not too much to get into the nitty gritty of this, but we know from Freedom of Information that not a single piece of paper existed that suggested that the decision was taken or that the department was considering it, efficiency savings when it took that decision. And the onus would be very much to prove as to whether it was um, a decision taken on those grounds or not. Now, after the decision had been taken, it was reviewed in the mouth of judicial re review proceedings that were taken on other grounds. Um, now, whether they'd have been successful or not, we we don't know, but it's a reminder that, that decisions are already constrained by the, the type of standards and propriety that ministers are to abide by. Bill of Rights provides a much sort of clearer framework as to what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable. And we would hope that within that framework, um, ministers and other decision makers would regulate their behaviour, to, to their conduct and their decisions to ensure it was compatible with the human rights standards within a, within a Bill of Rights. But a, a minister would not be able to take a, a decision that was discriminatory on the basis of language. A minister could take a decision, of course, for, for very good other reasons to cut a particular grant. Right. So those, mm -hmm. those controversial decisions can still be taken, but there's an onus on the minister and his department to be able to give an evidence base that proves that they, they took those decisions on solid ground. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. One, one, one last point, just for clarification. Are you, as a coalition, uh, suggesting that we combine the Human Rights Commission and the Equality Commission? No. No. Okay, thank that, you. We, we, we never have. We never have. Okay, thank you. Thank All you right, Meg. Neither of you have questions? No. Nope. We'll go to the members that are on Starleaf. I'll take them in alphabetical order. So I see Paula. Do you have any questions, Paula? Um, good, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you for coming today. Um, it, it doesn't feel that long ago since you came to brief us at, at part of the talks to try and get the restoration of power sharing up and running. Um, I'm going to sort of follow on from what Mike has been, uh, the channel he's been going down there in relation to um, your position on CEDO in terms of elimination of discrimination against women and around access to abortion services. I suppose it's the flip side of what um, Mike is talking about there, and it's about the minister's inaction to actually deliver on the law. Obviously, it's now lawful to provide abortion services, but they have to be commissioned. And I'm just wondering how you feel that a Bill of Rights could actually, without it actually ending up in the courts again, because obviously that is the position that we are in at the minute, but what, how could it, it strengthen the rights of women um, if a Bill of Rights what was in place? And the second part of that then very much leads into how this issue, like others, uh, like Leifa and maybe others in the past, are kicked from the department that they sit into the executive, and then there are issues then around, you know, need for cross um, community vote, and then like and then into petition of concern because obviously with the rise of the Alliance Party and you know our votes don't count in a petition of concern, and how then we can protect the people who are maybe not who are not green and orange but who, who want to sit in the middle. So it's really just about 
that sort of chain then through into ministerial decision making. Thank you. Well, can I can I say a word about the um, the abortion rights first of all? Um, I mean, we we were um, we were told at the at the end of that year long Bill of Rights forum way back in 2010 that one of the core reasons uh, that there was failure to get political agreement uh, was on the issue of abortion. Now the world has moved on since then, and uh, the UK government. Um, has had to comply with the recommendations of CEDAW. It had two years in which to do that. It did so. It brought forward uh, legislation during a period when we did not have a functioning assembly here. Um, and now that that is the law, we expect the system to comply with the law, um, to give effect to that law by ensuring that the proper regulations are brought forward um, to make the services available. So we would say that at the moment um, there's there's uh, there's a real danger uh, that the minister and and the Northern Ireland executive, unless it brings forward such regulations, um, it's uh, it's self culpable um, because the UK government, I think, would have to step in. They, I could not see that um, they would um, permit a, a devolved government to put them in the dock on an international issue, although, mind you, some of the decisions they've made recently, <laughs> they might not care that much about it. Um, but, you know, th th that's where we are. We had a Bill of Rights way back when. Um, there was a specific working group around reproductive rights that, that came out with some, some very sound recommendations. They didn't go anywhere at that time. But had we had... Um, some buy-in at that stage. We wouldn't have been um, through another decade-long campaign uh, getting to the stage where the UK government itself had to take that action. Um, we would have had some sensible decisions from, from our own executive. And I think that's the, one of the problems that I realised in all of the in all of the intensive work we were doing uh, you know, with our politicians back then. Um, people had some... Mis very strong misconceptions about what a Bill of Rights actually meant. Um, they really did think that it was going to interfere with their own personal um, uh, uh, beliefs, ethics, morals. They thought it might interfere with their ability um, to make resource allocation decisions. Um, um, we worked through um, a very important process that demonstrated it didn't have to be that way. There were absolutely and there were rights that could be progressively realised. Now, I think we've lost the ordinary time uh, in um, the collective working of our politicians um, and the cross-departmental working that was necessary to get us into a better place. That's the first element of it. I'd like to ask Daniel to come in. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed that the system doesn't kick me out again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just in terms of the second part of your question about the, the sort of array of vetoes, I mean, we would very much see and would very much like to go back to what was in the Good Friday Agreement, where vetoes, if you want to call them that, or, or safeguards, based on uh, criteria around equality and human rights, of which the ECHR and the Bill of Rights would be the, would, would be the core instruments within the... Uh, which would scrutinize within the petition of concern mechanism to, to scrutinize legislation and other measures as part of our manifesto of a rights based return, which we mentioned earlier on, we would like to see the removal of vetoes at the level of the executive that are based on sort of lay criteria that don't relate to equality and human rights. Like for example, something being to specifically something being significant or controversial, because the problem is at uh, many human rights issues, um, reproductive rights being one of them, the whole LGBT rights being another obvious example, Irish language rights being another example, can uh, can be controversial. And it's a, there's a bit of a Humpty Dumpty thing in that, um, as Lewis Carroll would say, that, um, that essentially controversial can mean whatever people want it to mean. Now, human rights can't mean whatever people want it to mean because you're talking, you can't make human rights up. Um, uh, you, you, the human rights are things that are defined in, in law and the United Nations and Council of Europe Human Rights Instruments um, and which have become increasingly codified over time. So therefore, if you're actually scrutinizing legislation against those standards, you have an objective measure. 
Whereas if, you, if you're scrutinizing legislation simply against whether something can be controversial, that can become a veto just to block anything um, on political grounds, on sectarian grounds, or on, on any other grounds. So we would certainly like to see a return to what was intended by the Good Friday Agreement, which is that those types of safeguards or vetoes would be grounded in equality and human rights. I, t I take your point that, it, that, that, the, that the scrutiny criteria doesn't fully address the issue, which we would like to see reviewed of designation, um, and whether that should be more tied to issues such as such as citizenship or, 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 or community background or other criteria that isn't just political affiliation that would ensure that problem that those who designate as other presently um, have no vote, essentially, in those, those types of things. That's certainly something um, that could be discussed and even within the framework of, of, of governance structures that would it would flow from a Bill of Rights, some of the recommendations of equal participation could prompt um, that uh, being re-examined. But certainly the Bill of Rights should go, we should go back to, to framing those types of uh, scrutiny tools around objective criteria. Sorry, thank, thank you very much. That was a very good answer. Thank you. All right, Paula, um, I'll go now to Mark. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, folks, for the presentation and the submission. There's a lot of interest in reading in it and, and listening uh, in it. We've touched there in the conversation about a lot of lessons that we could have learned here over the past uh, 10 or, or 20 years. I'm just wondering what lessons can be learned from other jurisdictions in terms of, I suppose, what would be the best, most suitable model of or, or for a Bill of Rights here. Oh dear, we have spent um, uh, in the region of nearly 30 years <laughs> looking at inter other, other international models and I, I think we benefited from um, uh, a lot of the input from, from you know, people from other jurisdictions, South Africa, Canada, um, and CAJ, um, I'm going to hand over to Daniel on this one, CAJ has been um, so very important in giving us all access um, to the experience of other jurisdictions and how their bills of rights um, have worked. And I would like to think that we can still capture all of that work over particularly the last 20 odd years because the models are there. Um, Daniel, it's, it's um, so much the, the territory of CA. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of international comparisons here to add to some of the ones that the committee have already had evidence on. I do think it's well worth looking at some of the more recent constitutional developments over the last couple of decades that have taken place in South America, for example, and yeah. within Latin America, whereby rights and particularly economic, social and cultural rights, and even some concepts, we take Bolivia is topical because there's just been a, an election there, but looking at constitution on recognition of, I suppose they called it plurinational, it was more around the, the, the coexistence of different ethnic groups with different cultural, linguistic traditions, etc., and how they could be modelled. So I think there, there is further sort of developments internationally that, that, that could be drawn on, as well as the codification of economic and social rights. But, um, and it's not an international example, but we, we should also be, be cognizant um, of the UK government's position originally to the Commission's Bill of Vice of saying, well, we have to look at how things are done in, in different parts of the UK, which is, of course, not the mandate of the, the Bill of Rights, in particular to the North Island. But there is no, the, 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 the idea of the UK as a unitary state is really a last century concept. If you look at the UK within the 21st century, you have very specific developments, some of which the committee have been appraised on in Scotland and Wales, for example, as to how rights protection including economic and, and social rights, can be incorporated. And if anything, we're becoming here the, the, the anomaly and that we're so far behind um, in how those uh, um, protections can be enshrined. So, so yes, I think there's a lot of international learning that can be picked up on, and, and some of it is, is more recent. OK, uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Patricia. That's, that's me for now. No problem. John? You're muted. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dermot, or sorry, Daniel and Patricia for your commentary thus far. I don't know if you had an opportunity to hear last week's committee hearing. I know it's 
uh, riveting viewing for many in the general public. Uh, but we had Dermot Nesbitt in, uh, and Dermot gave a presentation. And basically, what Dermot, without putting words in his mouth, is that the Human Rights Commission had mission creep in terms of its uh, draft bill that it published, that it actually misinterpreted uh, paragraph four of the Good Friday Agreement and went beyond that to incorporate rights that were never intended to. Uh, in that uh, in that bill, what what's your views of that? Um, well, well, okay, you go first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. First of all, no, I d didn't have a, a chance to listen to the evidence, although I did read Dermot's written yeah. submission. Dermot's someone who engages a lot with the Equality Coalition. He'd be at a lot of events, so quite familiar with the the take he'd have on this, and indeed on the the Framework Convention. We do take a very different view. Um, that starting point for the particular circumstances issue is what's written in the international treaty and the in the Good Friday Agreement, and also the, the the purpose of what you want to achieve with a Bill of Rights, which is, as we've said a number of times, its core purpose is really as a safeguard to prevent rights being abused in a way that fuels conflict and and division. And things like the right of housing being an example. So you have to include those. We don't see the Bill of Rights, so that the mandate for a Bill of Rights is just being restricted to a number of sort of consociational identity rights. We think that's too narrow in terms of um, preventing some of the some of the problems that have been de bedeviled the, the, this jurisdiction in terms of the exercise of power from, from the onset. Um, and uh, as Daniel said, I mean, I, I, I give Dermot credit for um, consistently engaging with us over time, and that has not been a bad thing. Um, but I think that even Dermot not today would, would accept that some of the arguments he would have made in the past about there not being the necessity before a broad-based Bill of Rights here um, lay in the fact that we had the ECHR and we had the Human Rights Act, and of course both are not very seriously in jeopardy. Um, and I imagine he's concerned about that too. Okay, no, and I accept the fact that in fairness to Dermot, he has been engaging over many years in relation to the rights debate, and that, that is a good thing. Um, like like others, I often find myself in disagreement with him, but he, at least he'll step forward and he will debate the issues. The, the other thing is um, rights can be a very uh, distant idea to, to people. Uh, when you're out, uh, you're working, you're trying to keep a roof over your head, you are uh, child mining responsibilities, all those things that, that make up people's daily lives. Rights can be a very uh, distant uh, idea. And people will say, well, what's that got to do with me? How do we make that issue relevant to everybody's daily lives? Uh, even though I fully accept it is a really abstract that someone's life uh, has to be protected in, in one way or another in terms of their, of their human rights. But how do we make this relevant? Uh, to citizens out there, and where they will take on board the importance of the work that we're trying to achieve here? Well, um, I would commend, first of all, um, the the work that has been undertaken over time by the Human Rights Consortium. Um, I mean, the CIJ found that the Bill of Rights was not the central issue that, that it promoted the creation of the consortium. And um, what the consortium did for a considerable time was direct work on the ground, particularly with the most disadvantaged communities. Um, to the extent that when there was a commission on a UK Bill of Rights visiting Belfast, um, we, it was able to hear evidence from representatives of um, very disadvantaged loyalist, nationalist and republican communities who all argued the necessity for a Bill of Rights and who put particular emphasis on social and economic rights. The other thing is the polling that was conducted some time ago um, by, by the consortium, consortium looking at the, um, the electoral base of all of our main parties, um, which produced no statistical difference, but in very large numbers, um, uh, people in this society saying that we needed rights, we, need, we needed a Bill of Rights, and identifying the most important of them the right to health, the right to social care, the right to uh, jobs. Um, the right to social security, the right to education, 
uh, housing, the environment. These were all these were all the top issues identified by ordinary people in the community who do understand if we have the conversation in the right way that these are fundamental human rights that we need to pay some attention to. Inside the trade union movement, I would say to you that um, we've had no difficulty over the years in our membership realizing that women's rights are human rights and that workers' rights are human rights. So when the conversation takes place in the right way, <laughs> there's a big groundswell of desire for a Bill of Rights for Women's Rights. Okay, thank you. All right, John. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel and Patricia. Oh, Chris, where are you? Sorry, I didn't yes, see anything. Yes, I just want to ask one question. <clears throat> um, Daniel, you referred to there are examples of good bills of rights in South America. Which countries do you have in mind? There's been quite a few countries that have gone in through constitutional reform. So um, I think Bolivia is one, Ecuador is, a, is another. Um, but there may be others. I'd be happy to gather together some information if that would be of assistance. It's just that I'm mindful of the fact that Venezuela went on, undertook a significant drafting of a Bill of Rights, and this is now a country where people are forced to eat their pets because of starvation. So whilst the regime might put up and highlight, you know, this is our expansive Bill of Rights, the actual capacity for it to deliver on those rights for the people is clearly being very limited. That's true. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's true, Christopher, but we also have um, growing food banks in this country. Um, and, you know, if ever, if ever they were pointing to a need for a Bill of Rights to be able to address in conjunction with our, with our commitments on equality, um, the real challenges in this society, it is shocking that all these years after the peace agreement, this is now a more unequal and a poorer society for many people. All right, Christopher. Thank you both for your presentation and for, for joining us this afternoon. And uh, we'll let you s is go now. Thank you. All right. So, members, uh, the next item on our agenda is the Chair's business uh, at item number three, and we don't have anything. We then have uh, item number four, draft minutes. So our, the draft minutes for the last meeting on the 15th of October are page 17 of the pack. Everyone's content? Content. Yeah, so we can note them. Matters are raising, number five. We don't have any matters are raising. Number six, correspondence, and the correspondence memo was on page 23 of your pack. We just have a letter from uh, the clerk of the Joint Committee on the Good Friday Agreement in the 26 counties. So that's just to invite us down. Um, which we had been planning to do, so I think we're going to revisit that in the new year, depending on how... Um... Yes, they've, they've imposed a hard border on us. <laughs> on every county, mm -hmm. on every county, Christopher. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not just on, on the six up here, so uh, we, we can't get down there for a wee while yet. Um, so then, number seven, forward work programme, if members are content to note that. Mm -hmm. And does anyone have any other business? No. No, so then we can note the, the date time place of our next meeting, Thursday the 5th of November. Next week is recess at 2 p.m. in this room when we'll hear from Professor Chris McCrudden and the Human Rights Consortium. Thank you. All right. Thanks. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.